Let's dive into the world of intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems, or IDS slash IPS for short. In this video, we'll break down how the pattern matching rules work, and we'll explore the strengths and weaknesses in today's threat landscape. While I'll be using PFSense with Snort for today's demo, I want to note this equally applies to Sericata and many other firewalls as well, so let's get started. <music> Like all fun learning adventures, we're going to start with reading the manual. Well, don't worry, I'm not going to have to read all of it. I'll leave it linked down below if you would like to, though, because it does explain a lot more than I'm going to go into because it's really out of scope of exactly how to write the rules. I just want to talk about the basics and examples of how the matching works. So here in the documentation, they give you an example of how to write a really basic rule. This is an alert rule that's going to say, any TCP traffic, whether it's inside or outside, so any, any, because you can be implicit and say only coming from inside the network or only coming from outside the network, but we'll just leave it simple as any, any, and any source originating port, but destination port 80, and then matching the content of Bob here, we're going to get an alert. This is a really basic rule they have you write. So we're just looking for the content of Bob going across port 80, and it would trigger this rule. Now, getting a little bit more complicated, they have other examples here, such as we're looking for something landing on port 7070. Once again, any, any port 7070, this is the rule it would trigger, but it's looking for a specific hexadecimal pattern. So if FFF4, FFFD06 is within the content string of that particular packet as it goes through and gets inspected, it will then trigger and say, hey, this is the alert that was triggered. And we have one here. If you're not familiar with FTP, it runs on port 21. So you'd have an FTP trigger based on not only port 21, but also matching this particular string. So if that string is matched, that's how it works. It's really simplistic in terms of the traffic passes through. It analyzes the particular content ID strings that they've come up with that threat researchers identified as a pattern of attack or something you should be concerned about, whether it's a scan, it looks at that, looks at the port, has those match, and then it triggers. So now let's go over to PFSense and actually look at a trigger and dissect it a little bit further. Now I'm over here in my PFSense system running Snort, and let's dive into some very specific alerts that Sericata is actually really good at, and that's scanning alerts. So this IP address here, 172.16.16.41, I had running scans of my network. The entire subnets that I have attached to this. And because this is passing through the firewall, obviously the firewall would not see it if it was just on one local subnet, it wouldn't see the scans. But because this crosses over into other networks, so we're starting at this 172.16.16.41, and we went over to another network that is attached to this, 10, 12, 12, 15, and 10, 12, 12, 2. It's just running scans through all these IP addresses. And of course, there's a ton of alerts. Let's focus in on one specific alert, such as this ET scan or emerging threat scan, HID Vertex Edge Door Controller Discover. We can see it came from 172.16.16.41. The source port doesn't matter. The destination port does. And so it's saying it hit port 4070. Let's explore a little bit deeper into that particular rule. Now, to look at the rules inside of PFSense directly, we're going to go here and edit the interfaces, and we're going to go over to rules. We want to choose the emerging threat, so it's emerging scan rules, which we're going to find right here. That's the ET scan. That's how I knew which rule to find here. And then we'll just do a little control F, and we'll jump to the HID vertex edge door. Once again, this is the trigger itself, which is looking for UDP traffic sourced any any on the home network and uh, destination port 4070. And if you expand the rule out further, it is the rule written just as we have seen it inside the manual for snort. So this is how those rules are written. And here is what it looks for the discover. And it's these potential hexadecimal addresses after the word discover that lets it know that someone's scanning for this particular device and therefore trigger an alert. So you know that the scan is happening. Now let's take a more general look at the alerts that I have in here. And the first one on top is syncthing.net. The reason sync things in here is not because sync thing itself is nefarious, but because threat actors are now known to be using sync thing to exfiltrate data. Maybe they watched my tutorial on sync thing and decided it's a great way to synchronize files, even for nefarious reasons. And it's very common for threat actors to use open source tools that are very common because they may not get detected. And this is where your IDS system can be effective because it's alerting me that these IP addresses like 172.16.16.9 is beaconing out and it's seeing this over port 53 because I'm not using encrypted DNS. So it's able to see that query and then alert me to syncthing.net being resolved. Now, of course, if that system 
172.16.69 was not using my PFSense as DNS, was using not port 53, but an encrypted DNS, it would be blind to it and it would have no idea that it was going out to sync thing. And same thing goes for many of these other alerts that you see in here. They're all sent over plain text, including like this BitTorrent announce one, so it's able to see it. And if we switch over to my demo lab, there's a few other things I have in here where it does see things on port 443. But the only thing it's seeing is the TLS SNI or server name indicator because that's where it is giving the name of the server. This is how you have multiple SSL certificates on a single IP address. So this destination IP may be completely fine, but it doesn't like the IPFI.org domain. And because when we send the DNS request, we do the lookup, we right here is that same lookup right here for IPFI, and we get a server name indicator header that we have to send because we haven't sent the SSL encrypted yet. We have to tell it what certificate we're asking for. And we're going to be asking for a certificate for that particular domain. So that part is all passed in the clear. Once the certificate is enacted and all the traffic is encrypted, this becomes blind to whatever was transported across there, therefore making it ineffective at any more knowledge other than we know that this query first looked up on this IP address, which was looking up Cloudflare for the domain resolver, which was all done purposely on this demo lab in plain text. And then it sees the SNI and it triggers this IPFI.org because it's in a list for some reason. Now, hopefully from here, you have a better understanding of how the IDS system sees these patterns when they're not encrypted. And in our SyncThing example, it was easy because I left SyncThing at default. But if you followed my SyncThing tutorial, you know, you can change all those defaults. You don't have to have it beaconing out at all. You can be implicit about what traffic it uses. You can change what port it's on. And then your IDS system would look at it like it looks at any other encrypted traffic for the transport layer being TLS. It would look mostly like website traffic unless someone was really poking away at it and looked at those packets and go, hey, that's on 443, but that's not normal web traffic. That's something else. That being said, not likely that your IDS system would pick that up. So a more sophisticated threat actor knows this. They're going to have tested their deployments against things like Snort, Sericata, or modern firewalls. This is how they work. This is why they have leveled up so much and are still able to get through these defenses of large companies. It's because the firewall is not really the end-all be-all with all of it. The way we handle this as an IT service provider, as a person tasked with protecting our clients, is not just data we get from the firewall, because we know it's blind to so much of it. It's having that data correlated with application data. So it's network data, application data, and being able to say, yes, this is or is not a threat, and this is where that reached out to, and happening at the endpoint, that's a lot more effective. But the question is, should you run an IDS system if you're a home user? Well, that depends. An example of PFSense I gave, yes, I had all the rules that you can fine tune, and I've got two different videos. You'll find one for Snort, one for Sericata about setting up the rules and fine tuning them. But will you take the time to set them up and fine tune them? Or would you rather just outsource it and have a company that has a checkbox that's an on or off switch for, you know, medium or high, low, whatever those settings are for detection. And now you're trusting them to set that for you. And you will not really know how effective it is unless you take time to test it. For example, you know, running some scanning tools and see if your IDS system goes, hey, look, there's some scanning tools running on here. They don't always give you a lot of effectiveness. When you get into the larger commercial, let's say a Cisco, firewall they give you a lot more rules but of course those come with their own challenges in terms of price and expensiveness of them and many of these large companies do have them and things still get by the firewall so it's just not the security blanket i think it used to be it's more of an amateur catcher which is not a bad thing there's still amateurs floating around out there but don't get too comfortable just because you have an IDS system turned on or think it's the end-all be-all for the network. For the most part, most people, especially the home user market, they're going to click on something where they put their username and password in a site that they didn't mean to because they thought it was the right site. That is the most likely form of attack besides maybe drive-by download, something you pulled out of the browser, some mail advertising campaign that had a download link. And I pretty much don't think any download links aren't encrypted that I see anymore. Could be exceptions out there. Like I said, there's some real amateur campaigns, but those download links being encrypted means your IDS system isn't going to be effective against them at all. So just don't get too comfortable because you've got that box turned on and whatever firewall. So it's not a matter of it's ineffective as in 0% efficacy. It's just not very effective against modern threats here in 2024.
Now, this is likely a topic that a lot of people have a very strong opinion one way or another on, so leave that opinion down below in the comments. Or for more in-depth discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com. Also, like and subscribe to see more content from this channel, and I'll see you over in the forums and maybe in the comments section. Thanks.